Hey, what's going on, Who That Nation? It is yours truly, TJ Jones, the host of the State of the Saints podcast. And some of you probably thought about starting your very own sports podcast. Well, let me help you out. I want to tell you a little bit about Anchor. Now, if you haven't heard about Anchor, it's an easy way to make a podcast. And it's free. You don't have to worry about paying a bunch of money each month. There are creation tools to allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you, so you don't have to worry about that. So it can be heard on apps like Spotify and Apple Podcasts and many, many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. So go to anchorfm.com and start your very own podcast today. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Hey, what's going on, Who That Nation? It is yours truly, TJ Jones, the host of the State of the Saints podcast. And welcome to another edition of the State of the Saints podcast live on YouTube and Facebook. Thank you very much for tuning in. Really do appreciate it. And also want to give a special shout out to everyone that may be listening to this in audio form. We really do appreciate it as well. On this edition of the State of the Saints podcast, we're going to be talking about Saints safety, Marcus Williams. Now, we're talking about Marcus Williams because Marcus Williams seems to always be the topic of conversation in the Who That Nation. You have a very mixed bag of critiquing the career of Marcus Williams. A lot of people consider Marcus Williams as a really good safety. They think that he does some really good things. And then you have the others who feel like Marcus Williams is a waste of time. They feel like he is a choke artist. And a lot of people feel like the Saints shouldn't be wasting their time with him. So what Marcus Williams is really the Marcus Williams we need to be paying attention to? Well, Marcus Williams did talk to the media earlier this week. And he talked a little bit about some things he feels like he needs to improve on. I definitely have to improve on my tackling. Uh, I felt like last year was a down year. Um, the, the few the, the few years before that, prior, you know, I was I was doing well, and last year I, I kind of let off, and I shouldn't have. And I, I know I need to get better at that. Um, I think that's one thing that that will elevate my game and and help everybody else around me. Um, that's that's just my own personal opinion. I, I I know you can see it on film. You can see it on there. It's, it's not. It's not you can't be blind to it. Uh, I can't be blind to it. And I know that's that's where I need to improve on, and I'm not going to shy away from it. I'm going to go out there and do what I have to do. Work on that in practice. Work out and walk through every single every single day. Uh, that's what I worked on in the off season. So that's one area I feel like I need to improve on. And and you know the film doesn't lie. Will the real Marcus Williams please stand up? Will the real Marcus Williams please stand up? Who is Marcus Williams, really, what you see is a guy that really took an evaluation of his career and he really assessed uh, what was going on in his career. And it seems to me like he is trying to fix the issue. Now, this is no surprise. I mean, me, the host of the State of the Saints podcast, I've said this on several occasions. I refer to Marcus Williams as the notorious knee tackler, always going at somebody's knees never really putting the, his uh, his shoulder pad into the chest of his opponent, never really out there lowering the boom on nobody. I think the only time I ever seen him put a real hit on a player is when he hit Humphreys for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He put a big hit on him. But besides that, Marcus Williams is not really known as a tackler. And I feel like that is something that is very, very alarming for a guy who plays safety. I mean, think about this, Who That Nation. When you think about the safety position, you think about people like Troy Palomalu and Ed Reed and Brian Dawkins and Bob Sanders and uh, and Rod Woodson. 
guys that are not afraid to lower that boom. You can even throw John Lynch up in that thing. These are guys that are the last line of defense, and they are the guys that are supposed to strike fear into the hearts of slot receivers and wide receivers that come their way. Marcus Williams does not strike fear into anybody's heart, okay? And I like Marcus Williams. If you've been following the State of the Saints podcast, you already know. I like Marcus Williams. I spend most of my time defending Marcus Williams because I really think he is really good. I feel like ever since his rookie season, ever since the Minneapolis miracle, for some apparent reason, he could not allow that moment to get out of his head. And look, I understand why. I mean, every time you look at, uh, you know, a, a, a premiere or, or, you know what I'm saying, a promo, they always have that play that's being shown over and over again and i get it but at the same time it's getting to the point where marcus williams is allowing the minneapolis miracle to define him because every time a crucial moment happens in a game it seems like marcus williams is on the receiving end of you know a, a backlash from the Houdat nation no matter how good he plays i mean i think about when he, he went up against the Houston Texans and he caught that interception. I think about when he caught the interception against the Atlanta Falcons early in the season. I think about uh, the pick six that he had against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. All good stuff. But then for every interception from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, you have him giving up a play to Everest for the Los Angeles Rams and NFC Championship game, right? For every interception from the Houston Texans, uh, you have him – you know what I'm saying? Getting dragged down the field by George Kittle. Uh, for every interception by the, you know, the Atlanta Falcons, you have the Minneapolis Miracle. So it just seems like it's just a mixed bag when it comes to Marcus Williams. So that's why I keep saying, will the real Marcus Williams please stand up? Who is Marcus Williams really? And do we in a Who That Nation believe that he deserves to be paid? Now, I'm going to give you my opinion before I start reading and going down the timeline. This is the way I feel about Marcus Williams. I do feel like the Saints need to pay Marcus Williams. Now, Marcus Williams stood up here, and y'all just heard the clip. He said that he has issues with tackling, which is very, very alarming for a guy at the safety position. So, I feel like the Saints need to pay him. But Marcus Williams needs to be realistic on how much he needs to get paid. Now, you don't need to be asking for top safety money because, quite frankly, you're not a top safety. You're not. You're middle of the pack. You're above average. In, in some circles, you're considered really good. But let's just be honest about this. If you can stand up in front of the media and say that you struggle with tackling and it's very alarming and it's pretty obvious that I'm struggling, you don't need to be asking for a whole bunch of money at the safety position, which means that I feel like the Saints need to pay him as a middle of the pack safety because he has played like a middle of the pack safety. So you don't need to be out here breaking bank and feeling like you deserve more money like you to David and Clowney and you're going to get your feelings hurt. You don't need to su subject yourself to that type of heartbreaking disappointment. Allow the New Orleans Saints to give you a reasonable contract. It don't have to be a long uh, uh, extended amount of years. It don't have to be five and six years. It could be two or three. Be realistic, Marcus Williams. You are not an elite safety at this point in your career. You are not the guy when a, a team needs a play. You're not a Ed Reed. You're not a Troy Palomalu. Okay. You're not an Earl Thomas. You're not in that realm just yet. Now, I'm not saying that you can't be but you're not there yet. Therefore, I don't feel like you need to go to the contractual table and sit up there and say, well, I deserve this because I had that. That is unrealistic. But I do feel like the Saints need to pay him, but within reason. That's the way I feel about Marcus Williams. And now I'm going to open the floor up to you all. Thank you very much for tuning into the State of the Saints podcast. Got a big week lined up for you all. Got some Special guests on the State of the Saints podcast on Tuesday, we're going to have former Saints cornerback Delvin Bro. Yes, that's right. Delvin Bro 
will be on the State of the Saints podcast uh, next week. So uh, be sure that you check it out. Uh, he'll be on the show 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Tuesday right here on the State of the Saints podcast. Looking forward to hearing from Delvin, bro. Know he has a lot to say. and I mean, he's out there doing a lot of big things. So we're looking forward to hearing from Delvin, bro. And, uh, you know, we're going to chop it up with him, man. But right now, we're going to open the floor up to you all. If you have any questions or comments, uh, feel free to comment. Uh, shouts out to Justin. Shouts out to James. My guy, Brian, Mark, Dexter, uh, Kimo, Travis, Jerry Poor, Terrence. Uh, man, thank y'all very much. We got Kenny up in this thing. Uh, thank y'all so much for being a part of the State of the Saints podcast. And uh, shouts out to John, too, because John says, Marcus Williams is a ball hawk. But I don't think the Saints will sign him to a long term deal. I think next year we will draft another safety. You know, that's a that's a really realistic uh, comment that you that you made right there. And I can understand why you made the comments, because, like I said, Marcus Williams is a mixed bag. You don't know what you're going to get. You know, like Forrest Gump said on the famous 1994 Oscar Award winning movie Forrest Gump, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. It's the same way when it comes to Marcus Williams. Marcus Williams is like those box of chocolates that Forrest Gump referred to. You never know what Marcus Williams you're going to get. You don't know if you're going to get the ball hawk and safety Marcus Williams or you're going to get the Minneapolis miracle Marcus Williams. You don't know what you're going to get from week to week. It just seems to me like, you know, it just it's just too much inconsistency from Marcus Williams at this particular point. Me personally, I still feel like his career can be salvaged and I feel like he is worth the investment. That's just me, okay? John, I can understand why you feel that way because on the other hand, there is, you know, that other Marcus Williams that I refer to that give up those big plays in crucial parts of the game. And maybe you fall into that category, John, like, man, I'm sick of this. I don't know how much more I can subject myself to from the Marcus Williams experience. So I understand that. That's a good point. Shouts out to Terrence. Terrence says, best safety in the NFL. Well, I'm going to say that Terrence is trolling right now. <laughs> because I mean, because there's no way in the world you believe that Marcus Williams is the best safety in the NFL. Look, I get it, okay? I, I come up here and I, I talk about pro football focus numbers too. And if pro football focus numbers uh, indicate anything, it tells you that Marcus Williams statistically is the best safety in the league. But numbers can mean one thing, folks, okay? Numbers can mean one thing. For example, Joe Flacco has more Super Bowl championships than Dan Marino. He has more Super Bowl championships than Ken Anderson. He has more Super Bowl championships, uh, you know what I'm saying, than, than, than well, right now, Lamar Jackson. But you wouldn't say that Joe Flacco was better than Lamar Jackson. You wouldn't say that he was definitely not better than Dan Marino. Okay, so the way I see it is sometimes numbers can, you know, not tell the whole story. I mean, I just, I'm just being honest here. Marcus Williams, analytically, is one of the best safeties in the league, arguably one of the best. But it's about making plays, okay? It's not always about being in position and knocking plays down in the first quarter. Um, pass deflections and you know what I'm saying and, and batting the ball back in the first quarter what about the fourth quarter huh what about the money downs what about the money minutes are you making a plays realistically he is not analytically he is so it depends on what you want to use I can use analytics I like to use analytics because analytics kind of focus in on the totality of the game you know what i'm saying like the entire game okay but there's a difference okay that is the reason why we sit up here and we refer to marcus williams as a good safety not great great is when a team can count on you to seal the deal at the end of the game how many times have we seen a reed pick off a pass and return it 99 89 79 yards when the baltimore ravens needed a play or Troy Palomalu jumping over the pile to tackle the running back when his team needs a play, or catching an interception when his team needs a play. That is what separates the good from the great, okay? 
analytically, he looks great. Realistically, he's good. Shouts out to Willie. What's going on, man? Appreciate you. Uh, Caribbean says, hell no. Hell no, he don't deserve another contract. Uh, Josh, the Saints fan, says, some players got clutch genes, some don't. I guess he should get paid, just needs to develop a clutch gene and tackling. That's that's a good point right there, Josh. I agree with you on that. Some players have it, some players don't. I just used those examples by Ed Reed and Earl Thomas and Troy Palomalu and Bob Sanders when he was healthy. Those were guys that teams can rely on to make plays. Those guys made plays in crucial parts of the game. Marcus Williams make plays, but it seems to me that he does not make plays when it matters most consistently. Okay, I'm not going to say he don't make plays because we seen him uh, catch an interception when Dak Prescott threw the Hail Mary down the field and he caught the interception to seal the game. Okay, so not to say that he hasn't made a play to seal the deal. It's just few and far in between. Okay. When it comes down to actually making a play and actually stepping in. And like Terrell Owens said on the sidelines one day when he was mic'd up, who can make a play? I can. Okay. I mean, you got to have that mind frame 24 7, 365. You got to have that mind frame. And if you don't, then you're going to continuously subject yourself to this type of criticism. And I feel bad because. Like I said, I like Marcus Williams and I want him to continue to be a New Orleans Saint because I feel like he is going to be one of those guys that Sean Payton has press conferences about when he's like five, six years uh, into his career after he leaves the Saints like he was with Malcolm Jenkins and saying, I shouldn't allow him to leave. Marcus Williams possessed that type of talent. It's just something about Marcus Williams. I just cannot put my finger on. I, I just can't. But it's just something about him that is separating him from being great. I mean, it's. It, I mean, he is on the cusp. It's. It's like as if if he can just actually turn it on consistently. It's almost like Marshawn Lattimore. Marshawn Lattimore is on the cusp of being great. The one that is stopping him from being great is Marshawn Lattimore, getting lost in the lights not being mentally focused the entire game. That is what separates Marcus Williams from being a great safety because he has all the tools. He has all the tools. Kenny says, I think if he has a good season this year, he'll be paid. I agree with that, but you got to get it done more so than not getting it done. And the only thing that can actually say it, like, Let's be real, who that nation. The only way that Marcus Williams can can get that bad taste out of our mouths about him is if he makes a play when it matters most. If something is on the line for the Saints, if something really matters, rather than be playoff positioning or a, a shot at the Super Bowl, that is the only way we are going to forgive Marcus Williams for what he did in his rookie season. Some of us still holding on to that to this day. You know it. I know it. You know I'm not lying. Some of us cannot get past the Stefan Diggs play. And it doesn't matter how many interceptions. It doesn't matter how many pass deflections Marcus Williams make. Until he makes good on that play, we are going to continuously criticize him and even nitpick his playing ability until he makes it right. But if he has a good season, then I, I agree with you, Kenny. I think he will get paid. Shamika says, I like him. And the Saints know that they have what they have in him. However, I don't know if they'll pay him big money. Shamika, I agree with you on that. And thank you for your comment. I 100% agree with you on that. I don't think they're going to pay him big money because Shamika, he doesn't deserve big money. Sorry, it's facts. He does not deserve big money. And I'm pretty sure, you know what I'm saying? I, I don't know if Marcus Williams watched the State of the Saints podcast. I don't know, man. But he doesn't deserve big money. And if I was to have a conversation with Marcus Williams, I would tell him that he doesn't deserve big money. I would say that he's good. He deserves to be, get extended. But he doesn't deserve big money. Okay? I mean, we got to be realistic about this. And I get it, man. It's about 
generational wealth. It's about taking care of your family and you want to be able to take care of your kids, kids. I get all that. But we got to be realistic when it comes to our positions, okay? George Kittle for the San Francisco 49ers a couple days ago got the highest paid contract among tight ends. I think we all can agree that George Kittle is the best tight end in football right now, okay? You can put Travis Kelsey in a, in a conversation, but overall, as a blocker, as a pass catcher, as a guy that is willing to get his hands dirty at his position, he deserves to be the highest paid tight end in the NFL. When you exceed expectations, nobody criticizes your contract. If Marcus Williams goes out here and tells the New Orleans Saints organization or his representation tells them Marcus needs to be the highest paid safety in the NFL, the Saints will look at him like he is a damn fool. Okay, I mean, I'm sorry, Marcus. It's facts, man. You're good. You're a solid safety. You're better than the rest. You're you're among the top five, no doubt about that. But there are certain things in your game that are not considered elite. Therefore, you should not get elite safety money. You should save that for the guys who consistently make plays and consistently that the team counts on them to make plays and they deliver. Marcus Williams does not consistently make plays and he does not deliver for the New Orleans Saints consistently to the point where we can say, man, this guy needs another contract. Man, he needs to be the highest paid safety in all of the NFL. Even though I'm saying that, I'm not, I can't, if somebody came to me and say, TJ, I don't think that he deserves his contract. I cannot argue with you to a point where I am 100% ha- and I have the courage of my conviction that Marcus Williams deserves an extension. You can argue me down on this point. If we was to talk about, let's just say, mm, Let's just say Ryan Ramchick, right? Man, somebody tells me Ryan Ramchick don't deserve to be extended by the New Orleans Saints. I would look at them like a damn fool. I would have the courage in my conviction and tell them, you are an absolute idiot if you don't think Ryan Ramchick should be extended. I can't do the same thing about Marcus Williams. The only thing that I have going for me when it comes to Marcus Williams is the fact that I like him and I think he has a lot of promise. But if somebody was to argue with me about what they see on a consistent basis, I feel like it can combat the argument that I would bring forward to them. So, but it's all about um, what he wants. And if he wants too much, then I think the Saints need to move on. Ghostface Griller, man. Shouts out to Ghostface Griller, man. Always with the positivity. I always look at your comments. And, um, man, shouts out to you. And you always... uh, you always uh, leave a positive comment and always, uh, you know, it makes me feel good, man, to know that somebody actually, uh, you know, uh, you know, looks forward to the shows and stuff like that. So thank you. Uh, who that, everybody? Uh, TJ, do you agree that Sean Payton should switch to a different brand of gum other than ju- uh, Juicy Fruit during the season? <laughs> Uh, Ghostface, uh, I don't know, man. I guess it just depends on his preference, man. I don't have a problem with that, man. His preference is Juicy Fruit, so let him chew Juicy Fruit. I don't care. As long as the Saints are out there winning games and, and he's making the right decisions when it comes to the play call, and I have absolutely no problem with Sean Payton at all. He can chew Juicy Fruit. He can chew uh, Backwood, you know, not Backwoods, but um, Copenhagen, all I care. As long as you – as long as you out there calling the right plays, I, I could not, I could kill this. Chemo says, uh, do you feel he will demand top dollar? Nah, nah, he shouldn't. Now, I can't speak for his agent, okay? His agent might come through with the stupid stuff, but that's the agent's job, right? The agent's job is to make sure that the player uh, gets the most money that they can possibly can get. But I feel like his agent at the same time, needs to be realistic so he definitely not getting top dollar i mean i hope he understands that caribbean cool says uh, i'll have him back for a veteran minimum contract no i wouldn't do him like that no i wouldn't do him like that i don't think he deserves a veteran minimum contract uh i would say that if i would sign him for three years 21 or i would even go 
three years, 24. That's eight million dollars a year. I would do something like that. OK, but uh, as far as like the 12s and the 14s and stuff like that, like Earl Thomas and them getting. Hell no. OK, seven or eight million a year for about three years. That's that's what I would give Marcus Williams. And I feel like that's a that's that is a fair price. In, in my honest and humble opinion, uh, if I was talking about paying uh, Marcus Williams. Uh, Josh also says, I hope he proves me wrong. I really do. I like the guy. He's a good safety. He's made some good plays, but when he's bad, he's bad at the wrong time. I, I don't have anything to uh, add to that comment. You're absolutely right. Travis says he's not high sock worthy. No, nah, no, nah, he's not, uh, Travis. He's definitely not high sock worthy. And and um, for those that just tuned in, don't know what that term actually means. Uh, you know, when you think back to the high socks, it was uh, – it was it was basically a, the claim to fame by Deion Sanders, okay? And after Deion Sanders, you see like elite cornerbacks starting to wear they socks high, okay? I feel like there should be rules to wearing high socks if you're a cornerback or in a secondary, okay? You have to be a beast in order for you to wear high socks. If you are not a beast, then you need to wear ankle socks. I mean, it's not hard, folks. It's very, very simple. If you're not elite, you cannot wear high socks, okay? If, if you, you're middle of the pack and, and, and the equipment manager passing around ankle socks, raise your hand, all right? If you're elite and you're a beast, you know what I'm saying? When the high sock table come out, raise your hand. Marcus Williams, you're not elite yet, bro. You know what I'm saying? I, I would say, look, you can put the sock to your calf muscle, okay? But up, up to the kneecap, no, sir. Not happening. No, sir. Can't have it. Uh, Calvin Scott says, outside of Darren Sharper, freak year, can you name a free safety we've had on a roster that was as good or better within the last 20 years? Marcus, to me, is better than Malcolm Jenkins when he played free safety with us. Uh, I would have to say that I agree with what Calvin says. I agree with that. And there's a reason why I compare Malcolm Jenkins, a young Malcolm Jenkins, to Marcus Williams. Uh, Marcus Williams is a better uh, pass catcher than he was. He a better ball hawk, okay? Malcolm Jenkins, in my opinion, just gave up too many big plays, and he sucked in coverage, okay? I mean, guys can, like, get open on him. when it Like, it, it's a difference. When Malcolm Jenkins was going up against a tight end, the tight end was getting the best of him. Marcus Williams just be out of position, okay? Marcus Williams just makes bad reads. He, like, he, he goes far left when he should be going far right. Or, you know what I'm saying, like, or he'll decide on the wrong plate. Malcolm Jenkins couldn't cover. Malcolm Jenkins was a, a above average tackler. He a better tackler than Marcus Williams was. But when it comes to being a safety, instinctive, Marcus Williams has the advantage on him, okay? But I'm not going to say that Malcolm Jenkins was just god-awful. He wasn't. But, I, I mean, there is an argument there that Marcus Williams has a little bit more. It's not much, okay? I mean, if they're running a race, I'm talking about they neck and neck, and if Marcus Williams sticks his neck out and gets over the tape before – Malcolm Jenkins, that's how, how the, the race is being run by those two, if I can compare them. Uh, Derek Tyler says, I think we will see a better Marcus Williams this season. With the leadership of Malcolm Jenkins, he will be checked. Derek, I agree with that. I feel like uh, Malcolm Jenkins coming into the organization, uh, a guy that already has some cachet, a guy that has skins on the wall, a two-time Super Bowl winning champion, a leader inside of the Philadelphia Eagles locker room, a leader outside of the field, a part of the NFLPA. This guy demands respect, and I feel like the secondary of the New Orleans Saints will give him the respect. I also feel like if Marcus Williams is willing to listen to Malcolm Jenkins, he can help him with a lot of things, especially when it comes to confidence, because like I said before, I feel like these two have a lot in common when it comes to some of the things that they dealt with early in their career. Malcolm Jenkins can relate to Marcus Williams 
because I feel like they were kind of the same. Okay, they they dealt with kind of the same issues. So I feel like by him being a mentor to him and him talking to him and putting him in a best position and helping him understand about making plays, I feel as if it can resurrect and even help the career of Marcus Williams. It's not like we're talking about a guy who can't play. Okay, Marcus Williams can play. You can not like Marcus Williams. You can roll your eyes at the sight of his name. But you have to be honest. You know that the guy can play. I am not going to go out here and say the guy can't play because he can. So I feel like it would be uh, best for him. I think it would be the best uh, case scenario. Well, the best situation for him, not best case scenario. Uh, the truth hurt says uh, it's two things. One, the tackling. Two, turning around when a ball is thrown in his coverage. Uh, yeah, um, I feel like he don't turn his head around enough. But, I mean, he does make plays, man. I mean, if anybody can jump in front of a pass to catch an interception, it's Marcus Williams. He does a really good job with that. Clarence says, man, I follow you like your podcast. Love it, uh, too, but you don't know what you're talking about. Who that? Uh, well, I mean, you're entitled to your opinion. You know, you're entitled to your opinion when it uh, – you know, when it comes to man feeling that way, but man, I just I mean I follow the team the best way I can. And when I get on here and I talk and I have these conversations and stuff like that, you know, I mean I just give my best analysis on it. I ain't saying that I'm the most correct person in the world. I'm not saying that I'm just, you know, what I'm saying I just got this this overwhelming knowledge on New Orleans Saints. People ask me questions. I mean, I give my opinion. OK, I mean, your opinion may be different from mine, but I mean, I appreciate you checking out the podcast, man. And hopefully you continue to listen. Uh, Caden says, I don't think he deserves big money. He's reliable, but he's no elite player. Uh, if he has a consistent season this year, I think he deserves a little money. Yeah, um, he's not an elite player, you know, like he, he's not elite. No, I'm not saying that he's elite. And I feel like I feel like anybody that thinks he's elite, I think you need to check out the definition of what elite actually is. But I do feel like, uh, you know, he deserves his money. And I feel like it is a deciding factor. OK, it's not like what it was with Von Bell. Von Bell, to me, I feel like he stepped up when a contract was on the line. I always question guys like that because I feel like when they get paid, they're going to fall back. Marcus Williams does really good things, but he does really bad things too. So it's kind of like he's on a fence. And I feel like this year is make a break for him. I know we talk about this guy's make a break. If he don't do this, it's make a break. No, nah, it's really make a break for Marcus Williams. So he can really decide his fate this season. Uh, Ronald says, uh, do you think there'll be a middle uh, major league baseball team in New Orleans? Oh, uh, Ronald, you know, I don't know, man. It's, it's, it's been a long time, uh, you know, I mean, in the, in the MLB has not come calling uh, the city of New Orleans. So, uh, you know, I mean, we've had the Zephyrs, and I think they're known now as the Baby Cakes, if I'm not mistaken. I remember going to Zephyrs games when I was a kid, you know, but I, I think that uh, New Orleans would be a great spot for Major League Baseball. I think that uh, people would get behind that. I mean, for the success of LSU baseball, you know, all those years where Skip Bergman was the uh, was the uh, old uh, manager of the uh, LSU Tigers. I mean, we know about the championship pedigree they had there. And um, also, man, I mean, I just think that we we love sports. You know, like I feel like if they do put a Major League Baseball team in New Orleans, people will follow. There's a lot of baseball fans in new orleans and i feel like uh major league baseball if they want to tap into uh the new orleans uh you know the city of new orleans and i, I think that it would be a great move for them and i think that it would be a great investment shamika says but that's why you have to do your job if you want that payday you better uh you're telling people uh you have a problem uh with doing what they have you uh, there for. That's a problem. Well, that's true. You know, the fact about it is, man, I just respect the fact that he addressed it. He addressed that he has a problem. He addressed that he has an issue. I can respect that. 
I respect the fact that he is willing to accept that. The next thing is, what are you going to do about it? So, uh, Clarence says, you're a mad Saints fan. Yeah, I am. I mean, I was born and raised in New Orleans, man. Born and raised in New Orleans, born in the Night Ward. My grandma been a Saints fan since the expansion. I mean, I just, man, all my memories was Saints, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> she was Saints in the fall. That's all I knew, man, growing up. So, definitely a diehard Saints fan, no doubt about that, Clarence. Uh, Joseph says, thank you for keeping it real. That's all I can do. You know, that's that's all I try to do on here, man. I don't try to sugarcoat anything. I just try to be as honest and straightforward as I can, man. I feel like you're all, you all deserve that. Uh, Aaron Davis says, only thing Marcus Williams needs to improve on is his tackling technique, a fixable mistake. Yeah, I mean, tackling is about a want to, okay? I mean, you got to want to tackle. Okay, it's not, I mean, it, it's rather you you want it or you don't. Plain and simple. It, it's, it, it's no in between. He has to want to tackle somebody. He has to want to bring them down to the ground. If not, then you're going to continue to have these same issues. And it's not like how Deion Sanders was, folks. Deion Sanders was a shutdown corner who hated to tackle. People didn't throw his weight. When you threw Deion's weight, he was going to get a pass deflection on interception. It made up for the fact that he didn't want to tackle. Okay, it made up for that. With Marcus Williams, you're playing a position that you cannot be afraid to tackle. You can't. Not at the safety position. Not at all. Tim, thank you very much for the $5. He says, Marcus Williams and Traquan Smith are in the same position with me this year. Uh, will the year to prove if they are worth it? Look, let me tell you something. I don't look at Traquan Smith and Marcus Williams in the same category. I just don't. Traquan Smith is a little bit lower and below what Marcus Williams is. I feel like the Saints would really stay up at night trying to figure out if they want to keep Marcus Williams or not. I don't feel like they'll put that same energy into Traquan Smith. I feel like the way Traquan Smith's career is going, they feel like a Traquan Smith is growing on every tree. Okay, there's nothing about Traquan Smith. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I just got to be honest. There is nothing about Traquan Smith that stands out to a point where you would be like, man, we really got to keep Traquan, man. I really want to keep him. Nah, I mean, it's not anything that you have to stay up at night to figure out. Traquan Smith is making this argument really, really easy to get rid of him. Marcus Williams, on the other hand, he does do good things. And analytically, you have that to back up on, okay? So when it comes to Traquan Smith, right now, all you have is a guy who seems like he's afraid to really go make a play, okay? The true jury says, to me, the Saints got playmakers all over the defensive side of the ball. If we can find a way to limit the injuries, no excuses for us not to be a top three defense. I agree with that. The truth hurts. Uh, it's about time the Saints step up and be a part of that top uh, echelon of defense. OK, the upper echelon, if you will. OK, it's about time for those guys to step it up because they got too much talent, too many first round picks, too much athleticism, too much skill on the front, on the front four. And, and, and their linebackers, and even in the secondary, for them not to be among the top defenses in the league. These guys just got to stay healthy. They have the chemistry. These guys have been together two-plus years, and they should understand that I need to be here. You need to be there. Let's make these plays. Let's become an elite defense because this is the thing that helped the Denver Broncos back in 2015, and I know I, I've been beating this horse dead but I feel like it is something that is so relevant to what's going on with the Saints right now. Back in 2015, our old Peyton Manning was carried by the Denver Broncos defense. I feel like the same thing could happen. The same thing can happen with the New Orleans Saints. You have a quarterback that can make the play to extend drives. All you need is a defense to help him out. All you need is a running game to help him out. If you don't, then I don't know, man. Maybe you need to reevaluate some of the things that's going on. Ghostface says, after Kittle got paid that huge contract, I would be killing it to get that money. 
Uh, I would be snapping necks and cashing checks <laughs> if I were Marcus Williams. I mean, this is a great moment for Marcus Williams. It's a great moment for him to step up and really quiet the naysayers, quiet the critics who put his his transgression all up on the TV. Okay, this is the year that can define you. This can define your career. Do not let this moment slip. That's what my advice would be to Marcus. Daniel says, who do you believe will be the next Pelicans head coach? And what's your thoughts on Zion Williamson? Uh, well, that's a good question right there. Who I feel needs to be the next Pelicans head coach? Mark Jackson, okay? Mark Jackson uh, needs to be the next uh, Pelicans head coach, Okay. Uh, Mark Jackson is, is the, the brainchild behind the Golden State Warriors. I don't care about what they talk about with Steve Kerr. Steve Kerr got them over the hump. You can make that argument. It's kind of the same thing with John Fox and Garrett Kubiak, if you want to, you know what I'm saying, compare with the Denver Broncos since we were talking about them earlier. I mean, you know, John Fox built the team. Garrett Kubiak got them over the hump. Uh, you know, Mark Jackson built the Golden State Warriors. Steve Kerr got them over the hump. I feel like – uh, Mark Jackson would be a great uh, fit for them. I'm not uh, too high on Fizdale. I heard his name going around. No, he used to coach the Knicks. Not a real big fan of that. Look, somebody needs to go out there and, and really be able to touch and, and help mentor Zion Williamson, man. You know, Zion Williamson, he has a lot of talent. Look, there, there's been talk about, you know, saying his diet and nutrition. I mean, I know y'all heard it, but the thing about Zion Williamson, I think he has a lot of talent. Um, the fact that he's actually doing this, being overweight, imagine what he would be if he was actually in shape. But at the same time, I get it, man. I mean, you coming from what? Spartanburg, South Carolina, which is not too far away um, from where I am. You know what I'm saying? You you come from a place like that. You come from absolutely nothing, poverty stricken. Now you're a millionaire. Everybody want to take a picture with you. You got million dollars of endorsements. And you live in a city where the eating is damn good. You know what I'm saying? Like getting a high size his own French dress. You get what I'm saying? You can walk down the street to Emerald Lagasse's restaurant. Look, I feel you on that. But Zion Williamson has to uh, get himself into some kind of shape, man. And I feel like the, the Pelicans need a coach that can hold them accountable. The problem with the Pelicans is they was giving up too many late leads, man. I think when they play, I don't know if they played the Jazz. I think they had like a 16-point lead. You know what I'm saying? In the Kings game, they had a lead. It, it just seemed like they cannot make the adjustments, okay? And I feel like they made the right decision uh, getting rid of their head coach and moving into a different direction. If you want to save Zion Williamson's career, you want him to be the leader of the NBA, and not Jai, Jai Morant, who did an outstanding job against the Trailblazers at about 34 points against them, then you need to hold him accountable, and you also need a coach that can mentor him and also mentor the rest of those young players on the team because when you look at people like Brandon Ingram and Lonzo Ball, I mean, these guys right here have a great nucleus of players to actually be playoff contenders. Not saying they'll be a number one seed, but they definitely can be like a five or six seed in the future pending that they get the right guy in place. And I feel like Mark Jackson is the right guy because he showed that he can be a team builder. So that's my opinion on that. I mean, I know it's the, I know it's the state of the saints, but you know, I just, that's the way I feel about it. Mark Jackson would be the answer. Uh, Christopher says, yes, his pro football focus is always best. The top. Yeah, it is. Uh, Derek says, TJ, you are telling the truth. When Marcus Williams missed that tackle against Minnesota, it was horrible. They kept playing it, and it didn't make it better. Ten seconds to go to the NF to the, uh, NFC Championship. Yeah, I, I mean, you're right, man. I mean, imagine, you know what I'm saying, your, your worst moment of your life being played over and over again. At least if something embarrassing happened to you in your life, it, it'd be stuck in your head, but it's not up for the whole world to see. Like Marcus Williams' transgression, you know what I'm saying? Like one of the worst moments of your life is being advertised. You know, like, I mean, mm, kind of hard to deal with. The truth says, you're right, TJ. Breeze in the same situation. 
the good old Peyton Manning was in. <clears throat> in 2015, our defense going to step the hell up uh, on offense, run the ball because Breeze uh, don't need to be throwing 40, 45 times. Yep. Yeah, definitely don't need to do that. Saints tight end. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Saints got some good tight ends, man. I'm looking forward to seeing those guys. And I'm also looking forward to seeing if uh, Tommy Stevens can actually make that transition. Uh, Zion Williamson. Yeah, man. Zion Williamson is a, a great talent, but I don't know, man. Right To me, I, I hate to say it, but they actually hyping him up more than he needs to be hyped up right now. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like the, the media is doing their job to uh, amplify what he does. Okay. I mean, they're doing a good job, but he got to help them out. Zion Williamson, um, Zion Williamson can make the all-star next year. He's that damn good. Yeah, he's good. But like I said, I think the media is doing a better job at hyping him up more so than what his play is indicating. Uh, Daniel says, can Alvin Kamara have a turn around season after being injured, uh, injury riddled uh, last season? Yeah, you know what I'm saying? I, I think he can because um, I, we talked to uh, – you know, we talked to Nick Underhill on the show. He was on the show a couple of days ago, and he said, you know, the first couple of games of the season with Alvin Kamara, Alvin Kamara was on pace to have like 1,900-some-odd yards from scrimmage, you know, if he was doing averages. So he was he was poised to have a really good season before he actually got hurt. So wouldn't surprise me if he has a really good season, man. I, I'm looking forward to that. It's not like Alvin Kamara, like, fell off the face of the earth or something like that. You know, he was hurt. And we all know how good he can be when he's healthy. So I definitely feel like he can have a bounce back year. I got a motto for Sean Payton this season, just three words, run the ball. Simple as that. Yeah, I mean, that's that's our motto for the year, you know, run the football, because I feel like it's a very, very important that they actually run the football. You know, you got to be able to run the football to uh, control the time of possession. I had an argument. I won't say an argument, but <clears> – <throat> You know, me and uh, Nick Underhill was going back and forth. He felt like, uh, you know, a quick, uh, you know what I'm saying, like quick slap by Michael Thomas is is just as good as a running play. I kind of disagree with that because I'm like, well, what if uh, Michael Thomas dropped the ball? What if uh, Trey Quan Smith dropped it? What if a defensive uh, back make a play? And then you stop on the clock. I don't feel like that's just as good as running a football. At least you know if you run a football, you get no yards. The clock is still running. So I feel like the Saints need to make a commitment to the run than some of those you know, quick slants because that's not going to always work all the time. Calvin says, uh, do you think Latavius Murray is a good fit? Yeah, I think Latavius Murray is a great fit for the New Orleans Saints. Um, the, the reason why you're having this conversation right now, uh, you even making that comment, rather, is because Sean Payton – didn't use him. He didn't use him the way they need to be used. Okay, I mean, rushing Alvin Kamara back, allowing him only to run about six or seven times, and we all know that just like Mark Ingram was, Latavius Murray is a preheat oven running back. For those that don't know what that is, you know how when you press the preheat, you might preheat your oven to 375. It takes a few minutes for it to warm up. Same way with Latavius Murray. He needs uh, carries in order for him to warm up. More carries he get, the stronger he gets. I mean, you think about the game against the Chicago Bears. He had 22 carries for 110 yards. Arizona, he had 20 carries for 109 yards. He is a guy that is a high-volume carry guy. The more that he carries the ball, the bigger chance that you'll get for bigger plays because he can wear down the defense. And I feel like the reason why that question is being asked right now is because Sean Payton did not do a good job utilizing the talent of Latavius Murray. Latavius Murray is a guy who no team, for some apparent reason, wants to invest in. He's always a guy that's going to be a backup. He's never a guy that a team wanted to be their starter. And it's sad because he has all the tools to be a really good, solid starting running back in the NFL. I think this P.J. Williams last season with the Saints, how do you feel about that, T.J.? Look, man, I'm over PJ Williams. I mean, I'm just <laughs> I'm just being real, man. Look, I've been counting down and, and constantly saying this is gonna be PJ last season, this PJ last season. 
and the Saints keep signing them back. I, I, I often tell a joke. I don't know if uh, P.J. Williams got some incriminating pictures of Sean Payton, got him in a precarious position. I don't know if he followed him. Uh, I don't know where he, he, he know where the body's buried. I don't know what the hell going on. But P.J. Williams always seems to get signed back by the New Orleans Saints. And for some apparent reason, they just love this guy. And I, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. But whatever he got. I mean, he he got some CIA, FBI type evidence on him. I mean, he must got some some damn wiretapping uh, information on Sean Payton because this guy stay on the team. I mean, I be knowing in my heart of hearts, in my soul, that P.J. Williams ain't coming back. And lo and behold, I'm looking at a notification and the same sign I'm back for another year. My goodness. Josh says, uh, do you think C.J. Garner Johnson name change will affect him in a bad way like Chad Johnson? No, I don't. You know, I don't care what his name is. He can name himself C.D. Duke, C.D. Lamb. Uh, you know what I'm saying? C.D. Player. I can give him out a damn. You know what I'm saying? Like, as long as he's out there playing, making plays, not messing up, and I think he has a lot of confidence, so I really don't care. You can name yourself whatever you want, bro, as long as you're making plays. Uh, that Christopher says, uh, how y'all going to keep talking about the Minneapolis miracle and not bring up how the Vikings, uh, or fave, uh, uh, it framed on Amazon and NFL shop on a frame made it. Well, look, I mean, look, that was a, that was a great moment. You know what I'm saying? If you're a Vikings fan, it was a great moment. You know what I'm saying? It was a very great moment. And, and just like with Garrett Hartley, I'm pretty sure somebody got that game winning 40 yard field goal in the house right now. Garrett Hartley, I'm pretty sure somebody got that that interception by Tracy Porter in the house, right? I'm pretty sure somebody got the Steve Gleason block punt. There are certain moments in Saints history that we hold near and dear to us, and I'm pretty sure it's vice versa when it comes to other fan bases. This play in particular. So if you're a Minnesota Vikings fan, like think about this: if the Saints were acting on the receiving end of that touchdown. Imagine how many times we would want to see that play. We would have that framed in our house. So I don't have any problem with that. I really don't. Uh, Peyton says, uh, uh, do you think well, we will keep Winston after this year? I don't I don't see Hill being an every down quarterback. Well, Peyton, uh, that, that remains to be seen. I mean, that remains to be seen, and you're entitled to your opinion about Taysom Hill, and I get it. You haven't seen much out of Taysom for you to say, you know what, this guy, you know what I'm saying, can be the starting quarterback. He only has 15 passes throughout his entire career, so it's not a, a huge sample size like you know Jameis can do. I do feel like the same sign, Jameis, because they're thinking about possibly signing him long term. It's a matter of what Jameis actually does with the Saints that will allow the Saints to commit to him, okay? I mean, he can make or break himself. So I do feel like the Saints could sign him back. Uh, Diggs was talking smack to uh, Gardner Johnson in his top 100 players highlights. Um, <clears throat> well, you know, I mean, I come with the territory, man. I mean, wide receivers going to talk smack to safeties and cornerbacks and linebackers that just – that's just what it is. You know, Stephon Diggs, that's just who he is. And he's a really good player, you know. So I don't have a problem with that. The Broncos are my second team. We got to remember that Peyton had a lot of rough losses as a Bronco before the Super Bowl, just like Breeze and the Saints recently. But I think the Saints will win it this year. Well, yeah, I mean, that's true. You know, Peyton Manning has some ups and downs. I mean, constantly going up against Tom Brady and becoming and, and receiving – L after L after L, you know, I get it. But um, Peyton Manning did make some really good plays. And, um, you know, he is one of the greatest of all time. So, like you said, hopefully, <coughs> excuse me, hopefully uh, Drew Brees can walk away a champion. Jonathan says, PJ is arguably our hardest hitter and best tackler, DB, not named Marshawn Lattimore. I will agree with you on that. Like, PJ Williams is a very solid tackler. Problem is he's a defensive liability in coverage. So if he was a better coverage uh, corner, 
he'll be really good, but he's not. So just like how we look at Marcus Williams, same way we look at PJ. You can do all the tackling you want to, but giving up big plays negates everything you do. The truth hurts says, if I was a coach in New Orleans, I'm being so patient with the offense, running the football, and calling passing plays to keep the momentum going. Then the chains moving, first downs. Uh, don't be in a hurry. Well, it seems like you're trying to be Vince Lombardi. <laughs> seems like you're trying to be Vince Lombardi, the truth hurts. But, I mean, I agree with you, man. You know, it's about time of possession. It's about playing good defense and running the football and throwing the football, you know, if you have an accurate quarterback, which the Saints do. So, I mean, that is a recipe for success. Jerry says, every time I think about the three heartbreaking losses, I cry. I mean, yeah, man, it was some hurtful plays, man. I mean, they definitely was a hurtful plays. Embarrassing to say the least. Clarence is laughing. Jonathan says, also true, TJ. Uh, Jerry says, like I said before, the 10 years of depression or <laughs> desperation, you already know. Yeah, man, um, it has been um, some very disappointing times as a Saints fan. But, I mean, we always come back with optimism every single year. So hopefully this can be our year. Daniel says, PJ is trash. Uh, he needs to go. I mean... Enough said. Uh, regardless, without fans, we're going to beat the Bucks week one, opening season. We can't let Tom Brady come to our house and beat us. Going to be an interesting game, especially without fans. I'll tell you that. David and Yamada and that D-line will dominate this year, which will make the secondary stand out. Yeah, David and Yamada is very underrated. He's a very underrated uh, defensive tackle. And there's a reason why the Saints brought him back. I like him a lot. I really do. I think he's a great guy for the rotation. Ray says PJ should have switched to safety way sooner. He probably could have been really good. I agree, Ray. You know, I feel like the Saints need to save his career by making him a safety. You know, I mean, you're already making CJ Garner Johnson a nickel corner, so why not make PJ Williams a safety? He's a better tackler than most, and uh, I feel like by him playing f far back, you know, it kind of helped him, you know, because he's not that fast, so I think they should have did that in the first place. Peyton says, uh, need a big year out of Davenport, need someone to help out Cam. I agree with that. You know, it is about time that Davenport steps up and play a 16-game season. I think we in a who that nation are tired of watching him, uh, you know, miss games and and not be able to contribute late in the season. I don't think uh I don't think Davenport ever even played in a playoff game, which is crazy, right? Saints have put him into the playoffs twice, and he hasn't played in any of the games. So um, it's about time that he steps up. Jared says 2010 beast mode, 2011 a catch, 2012 Roger Goodell, 2013 Seattle, 2014 17, 79, 2018 Minneapolis Miracle, and 2019 uh, Nola No Call, <coughs> 2020 push off, but I'm still here. Yeah, man. I mean, this has been a decade of uh, of heartbreak, but like I said, we always come back because we love our Saints. Derek says, "Hopefully, I need to. Uh, I won't need too much blood pressure medication this year." Yeah, man. Hopefully, hopefully we don't need it. Uh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure CVS Pharmacy and Walgreens be packed on Monday morning, man. People up in there trying to get that blood pressure medication because of the Saints. Uh, got their blood pressure high, you know, like, so hopefully we have some uh, some good games this season that don't require us making those trips to the drugstore. <laughs> uh, Daniel says, can Mike uh, Mike Thomas break his own record for receptions? Uh, I think it's possible. Uh, the fact that he catches over 81% of his passes, you know what I'm saying, the passes that's thrown to him, I don't see why not. I think he definitely can do it. I know Cook will ball out this year. Miss Ben Watson, too. Uh, yeah, man. I, I mean, Ben Watson was was much better the first time around as a Saint. The second time around, it was more about the leadership role. He really didn't do much, okay? So, I mean, I do miss him as far as his leadership, but not as a player the second time around. 
at least we ain't a Falcon or a Cowgirl. Yeah, we could be worse. I mean, the Falcons, you know, one of the bigger choke jobs in NFL history. And uh, the Cowgirls haven't done anything since uh, the first Friday movie was in theater. So, <laughs> I mean, it could be worse. I watched that Seattle game again today. Damn, I want that Kamara back. He was balling in that game. Yeah, he was. But, I mean, people get hurt. And he tore his MCL. So, that messed with his uh, ability to cut, be elusive as he normally is, and be shifty. So, it happens. Uh, I'm going to read one more. And this comes from Ray. He says, yeah, imagine being a Falcon fan. Uh, 28 to 3. Yeah, I mean, we'll never forget that. I'm seeing people put that on face mask and t-shirts and all that kind of stuff, man. So, you know, I mean, and nobody ever forget that, especially Saints fans. Uh, but I want to say thank you all very much for checking out the State of the Saints podcast. And uh, thank you all if this is your first time checking out the podcast. Hopefully, it won't be your last. And please subscribe to the YouTube channel, youtube.com, search the state of the saints podcast also facebook.com search the state of the saints podcast the audio version is available on itunes spotify iheartradio.com wherever you get your uh podcast uh streams from i'm pretty sure we're there as well and also once again on tuesday uh delvin bro will be the special guest on the state of the saints podcast uh that will be kicking off around 3 p.m eastern standard time so if you're not doing anything on Tuesday, stop by, check out the State of the Saints podcast with special guest Delvin Bro. Thank you all very much, and I hope you all be safe. Till next time, all I got to say is, who that?